Hello everybody, thank you for your questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions, so this is probably going to be at least a two-part video. So if your questions are not answered in this part, then just have a look at the next part. Um, but I'm going to try to get through everybody. If I've missed anyone, I, I do apologise. Um, okay, firstly, uh, somebody with what looks like um, a Japanese name. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, number one, what do you think of systems science slash theories critique of linear causality and reductionism? Well, I don't know anything about that, so um, I don't think anything about it. I mean, I I can say when it comes to reductionism in general, I don't consider myself any kind any kind of reductionist, at least where that's being proposed as a sort of you know universal claim about science, right? Like the idea that. <laughs> Uh, 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 biology as a whole will be reduced to physics. I mean, there are different kinds of reductionism and stuff, but my general take on this is that if we're advancing it as a sort of metaphysical thesis, as a claim about, like, the way the world is, um, well, I'm just sort of agnostic about that, but, like, you know, fine. I mean, I guess the, the, the general attitude is, okay, um, you know, biological entities are just composed ultimately of physical entities, whatever. Uh, you know, when it comes to the metaphysical stuff, I'm not really interested. If we're talking about relations between theories or relations between types of explanations and so on, um, yeah, I just don't see any... I mean, I, I don't see any good reason to uh, expect any sort of universal reduction to take place. Um, it seems to me that that's extraordinarily unlikely insofar as one of the things we need from science is we need it to be uh, we want our theories and models um, to be like applicable and usable and intelligible you know um, and if you were to I mean obviously if you were to like look at biological entities just in terms of collections of fundamental particles um, that would be hopelessly confusing um, so I mean that's a very very simple and naive point but I mean just on that kind of basis I I think there's a great deal of kind of abstraction and simplification that takes place and that has to take place and so that pushes me towards a kind of anti-reductionist position um, but when it comes to you know system science I, I have no idea so um, yep can't say anything about that um, okay number two what does philosophy offer or can offer us in our path towards ecological collapse and species extinction I don't know I mean uh, again you know this is like I... okay look when it comes to the current environmental problems right um, here's here's the thing if telling people like hey guys we'd better change what we're doing because if we don't civilization is going to collapse right if that's not enough to get people to change what could possibly be enough I mean I, I, I don't know what like what can I don't know what philosophy can offer right if that fact alone is not enough to get us all immediately to radically change our behavior then I, I have no idea what more I like can, can be offered from anyone um, I mean, so what philosophy offers me personally is that I enjoy philosophy and I think, well, you know, while we've got all of this, you know, we might as well enjoy it while we can. Um, so that's what it offers me personally. But how would I use philosophy um, to, like, what, deal with ecological collapse? Um, I, 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 I'm pretty pessimistic that there's anything that... I think the only thing that's going to make things change is when um is is when people's lives actually start getting affected in in a significant way in the sense that you know when when people have to start you know rationing food and so like food prices increase and when we we start having you know droughts and when uh, extreme weather starts um you know taking a noticeable toll on the economy and all of that stuff that's when people are going to be prompted to make changes, but it's probably too late by then. So, yeah, I, I, am, uh, I think it's all pretty hopeless. All right, then. Next person to ask me a question is somebody with what may be a... I, I don't know, is it a Russian name? Is it a Greek name? I have no idea. I can't pronounce it. Uh, it's, it's just got some funny letters. So this person asks, number one, your position on philosophy of mind. Well, that's a very, like, 
I mean, what 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 philosophy of mind? What aspect of philosophy of mind do you uh, are you asking about there? Um, because philosophy of mind is a pretty big field, right? Um, so I can say when it comes to the question of consciousness, for instance, um, I am completely agnostic about that. Uh, there are two. There are two extremes, right? And just to ch give an, just to illustrate how igno how agnostic I am, let me just talk about these two extremes. So on one extreme, right, there there are things like higher order thought theories of consciousness, and on these kinds of theories, some people might say, well, like in order for an entity to be conscious, right, maybe it literally needs to have language, or at least something like language, and it needs to be able to uh, conceive of itself like as an agent and like reflect on itself and think about its own thoughts right so on this kind of view consciousness is going to be restricted to i guess like normal adult humans but maybe even you know apes and dolphins and so on are not going to count as conscious um so that's that's one extreme view on the other extreme view you've got something like panpsychism which says that um consciousness is just spread throughout the universe that even fundamental particles like uh, electrons might have uh, some sort of phenomenal properties um, I mean actually uh, most panpsychists as far as I know um, tend to restrict their panpsychism to like the fundamental particles um, you know so it's relatively rare that somebody would say, you know, the Eiffel Tower or a rock is conscious. But actually, um, I, I don't see why you shouldn't make that step. I mean, if you're granting that there's some sort of phenomenal property that an electron, say, has a phenomenal property, why not a rock? I mean, in the same way, something like mass, right? Electron has a mass. Well, a rock also has a mass. Maybe phenomenal properties work, something like that. Who knows? But the, the key point is this. Um, I have no idea which of these theories is correct. Uh, or maybe it's neither of them, maybe it's something in the middle. I have absolutely no idea. So I am completely agnostic on the question of, of consciousness. Uh, I, I just don't know. I think both of these theories are about equally plausible, um, as are many others. And I don't really even know how to go about deciding which of them is correct. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, you asked me for my position on philosophy of mind. So there is one of my positions on one thing to do with philosophy of mind. I don't know whether that's exactly what you're asking about, but as I say, philosophy of mind is a big field. So um, you should have been more specific if you had something more specific in mind. OK, will there be a continuation of videos about relativism? Uh, yeah, in one way or another, I expect that to come up. I mean, I was going to do a series on relativism, and then I just ended up uh, not doing that, right? That's how it goes with me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I start things and just sort of move on to other things um, before they're properly finished. Okay, Adam Kennedy. Um, Hi, Kane, I have a hypothetical to test your consistency. Hypothetically, if 100 severely mentally handicapped people let's say they have the same cognitive capacity as a pig, were being tortured and all you had to do was blink your eyes to make the torturing stop, would you have a preference to stop it by blinking or not have a preference to stop it? Would you care at all that the torturing happening is bad for the people being tortured? Let's also assume that these people were on the other side of a brick wall so it's not like you're being forced to look at them or anything. I'm pretty sure you've asked me this before. Um, I seem, or at least somebody who was called Adam asked me something very similar before. Anyway, um, also, uh, like, I feel like I've kind of made my definitive statement on this sort of topic in my Animals Don't Matter video. But, um, right, uh, several things here. First of all, I want to point out um, that YouTube has very strict hate speech guidelines. Uh, you cannot draw equivalences between um, people who are mentally retarded and pigs. And you didn't quite do that. You just said, well, they have the same cognitive capacity as a pig. But Often the point of this type of argument is uh, is to suggest that they're morally equivalent in some. I mean, this is like like the type of marginal cases sort of argument, right? Which is going to try to show that um, mentally handicapped people and pigs are somehow morally equivalent. You cannot do that on YouTube anymore. Like you you just can't do it. I mean, you can do it, but like you're putting the channel at, at risk, or you're putting. Uh, I guess if you're a commenter, you're you might get. I don't know. I don't really know what the 
uh, responses will be from YouTube. And I'm not sure if this is even enforced. Um, I mean, but if you look at YouTube's hate speech guidelines, it is very obvious that these sorts of arguments are just unacceptable um, per the YouTube guidelines. Now, I don't agree with that. I'm just letting you know. Um, and I'm letting you know this because you might be inclined to respond to what I'm about to say. But just be aware, like, uh, you, you know, th th there are significant limits to how much we can have this discussion. Um, OK, then. Another thing here. Uh, you said um, that you wanted the hypothetical to test my consistency. I wonder whether this kind of thing is really a test of consistency. Um, so it seems to me that at most what you could what you could do is accuse somebody of arbitrariness, right? Like at most somebody's maybe drawing an arbitrary line um, and that perhaps that you would say they don't really have good reasons for favoring humans over, they don't have good reasons for favoring all humans over all animals. Like maybe it's arbitrary, but it's not inconsistent. In the same way, you know, somebody who says like, uh, only white people matter to me uh, and I don't care about black people. Well, that might be pretty repugnant, but it's not actually inconsistent, at least not in itself. Um, um, also, I mean, we're talking about preferences here rather than moral obligations, aren't we? Would I have a preference to stop it? Uh, so um, I don't know how interested I am in people's preferences. Uh, like, after all, if I had to choose between saving a man and saving a woman, um, other things being equal, I'm pretty much always going to save the woman. Um, that, that doesn't mean I think that women are more morally valuable or anything like that. Um, that's just what my preference will be. Um, in terms of moral status, men and women are exactly the same, but it's like if it were just up to me, you know, if there's like a burning building and I can only save one person, I've only got the tools, there's like a man over here and a woman over here, I know nothing else about them, um, I'm probably just going to go for the go for the woman. Um, maybe I shouldn't be saying this in public now that I think about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just the way, that's just the, the way it goes. Look, women, that's just, I just have a preference for having more of that in the world. I mean, just in general, right? I feel like it benefits me if there are more women in the world because, you know, I'm a straight guy, right? So even though it's, if I'm just saving one woman, that's only like a very, very slight, it's only going to change the proportions very, very slightly. It would still, it would still benefit me ever so slightly because, yeah, you, you see why I think, I feel like I'm digging myself in a hole here. What have I done? Let's move on. Right. Um, so, um, where, where are we with this? Oh, God, should I just stop this and restart? This is terrible. I feel like, okay, I've already been talking for like 30 minutes. I've just got to continue with this. This is awful. I don't know. Maybe I should, should I just, uh, oh, God. Right. Let's start this again and ignore what I just said. Um, so, Moral theories are, uh, as I see it, you know, products of negotiation with other people. And I would grant you this. If a moral theory entails uh, something that the vast majority of people consider to be a crazy conclusion, then that's just a, that's a bad thing, right? So if we're talking about what morally ought to be done, um, if I propose a theory on which uh, particular groups of humans are denied a moral standing, uh, nobody's going to accept that theory. Uh, and... Um, I mean, as it happens, I, I do think we can extend moral standing to mentally retarded people. So uh, if I was in this situation where I, or I had to blink my eyes to make the torturing stop, sure, I'd blink my eyes. Now, do I care personally about all humans? Uh, not really, but like, I'm happy to adopt the rule that if I can easily perform an action to end extreme suffering, then prima facie, I should do so. Because, you know, I'd want other people to act on that same rule and, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, there you go. That, I guess, answers that. Um, also, who cares if my preferences are inconsistent? I mean, uh, I, I don't see why that matters. Like, if you're talking about preferences, m maybe if you were to ask me to, you know, rate how much I like uh, uh, chocolate cake and how much I uh, like, do I like chocolate cake more than I like pizza? Um, and 
uh, maybe I might say, I, I can kind of imagine a situation in which I say, well, I rate chocolate cake nine out of 10. Um, and I like pizza more than chocolate cake. But then you ask me later and I'm like, oh yeah, I rate pizza eight out of 10. And I just haven't sort of seen that this is inconsistent. I mean, who fucking cares, right? Like people can have uh, these sorts of inconsistencies. And generally I think there is, a, a, in, in people's preferences, there's often a failure of transitivity. Um, so we often find that people will say, A is better than B, B is better than C, <laughs> right? But um, what would it be like? A is not better than C, Some, something like that, right? People uh, do have these inconsistencies in their preferences. And I mean, that matters sometimes, but if but not always, right? And I mean, if we're talking about a moral theory which constrains what we ought to do, then I think consistency is important for obvious reasons but like yeah if you're just talking about people's preferences and what they care about i don't really give a shit about uh consistency or inco about inconsistency there okay anders ness nice however that's pronounced will you present your dissertation in a youtube video um in a way i kind of already have i mean i've i've definitely uploaded videos which cover topics related to things I've been talking about in my in my uh, dissertation um, so I'm not sure there would be much point just like pr just presenting it you know like doing uh, just each argument and to be honest I I don't really like my dissertation very much it's pretty shit I mean it's like I've <laughs> I've I, I'm really sick of it at this point I want to move on I want to move on and think about other things um, so even once I've done the dissertation, maybe I'll come back to it a few years later. But right now, I'm gen I'm genuinely just sick of it, and I just want to get it finished and then forget about it completely. I don't even like the arguments in it. Like it's not it's not me. Um, what are your academic plans post graduation, dude? Have you looked at the academic job market? I don't have any academic plans post graduation. Um, <laughs> uh, what are your plans for the future of the YouTube channel? Uh, well, the lecture videos are going to continue. Uh, they're always going to be the backbone of the channel. Um, I'm hoping to do more collaborations with other people. Uh, you know, I, I really liked the the, uh, the video I did with perspective philosophy. We had that 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 discussion. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, I've already had various suggestions for other people that I could talk to, and I mean, I haven't asked them yet. I'm but yeah, I mean, so over the over the summer, I'm really hoping to get more collaborations going, and uh, yeah, just um, well, it's 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 just going to be you know philosophy, but lots of different ways of approaching philosophy, lecture videos, uh, discussions, that sort of thing. How has the growth of the channel affected you? Um, I don't really know. I mean, like. I'm not like I don't feel like I'm famous enough for this to have had any real effect on my life, right? Uh, I, I mean, I started the channel because I I love philosophy, I love doing philosophy, and I I think you know it's it's useful to uh, it, it, it's it's useful if you're learning something to figure out how to communicate it to other people, right? I think that you don't really understand something yourself unless you're able to. Uh, express it to other people in a way that they can then understand um, or well maybe you do understand it yourself but um, like that the best indication that you have that you understand something is when you can teach it to other people so you know, that's why I started the channel and that's pretty much what the channel continues to be used for from my point of view maybe um, doing this channel has pushed me into adopting stricter positions um, I mean I never used to really have strong views on things I was always happy to just present the views of others and just explore different views I would say that as this channel has gotten bigger people have wanted to know more about me and they've wanted to know more about my views which means I've had to think a bit more carefully and uh, about what my views are I've had to actually actively adopt positions uh, so that I can then answer people's questions. So maybe uh, it has affected me in that way. Okay, somebody called Apollon Miracle asks a question in Russian. Now, I don't speak Russian, so, um, you know, difficult to answer, but I put it into Google Translate and this is what it gave me. How do you feel about Tria's work? Um, well, the only Tria that I know of is Lars von Trier, 
I, I mean, if you're asking about a philosopher, then I, I don't know who that is. But I do know a Trier. I know Lars von Trier. I think his films are appallingly bad. Um, so, I mean, I haven't seen all of them. Obviously, I haven't seen all of them because the ones I saw were, I mean, g genuinely among the worst films I've, I've ever seen. Uh, I've seen, in full, I've seen The Idiots. I've seen Dogville. I've seen Breaking the Waves. Breaking the Waves I saw a long, long time ago. Like, it would have been about 16 years ago. I don't remember it so well now. I do remember The Idiots and Dogville very well. Um, they're just appalling. I mean, they're... they're yeah, I, I have nothing positive to say about any of those movies. Um, and um, as a result of that, I'm very reluctant to engage with any more of his work. However, uh, I did see... I was persuaded to see his mini series, The Kingdom, which I absolutely loved. It took me, it took, it took a long time for me to be persuaded to actually watch that because I'd already seen these films beforehand, um, and so obviously I wasn't very keen on, on you know, watching any more stuff by Lars von Trier. But um, yeah, I, 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 I was in the end persuaded to watch The Kingdom. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Um, it's a shame, you know, because from what I know about Lars von Trier, he seems pretty cool. Like as a person, he's he's definitely got a bit. He's definitely a bit of bit of an edge lord. I appreciate that, um, but I just, I mean, his films are just shit. So, yeah. Okay, Arka Makoti. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, um, but that's that's what it looks like. Uh, number one, would you please explain what semantic realism is? Um, semantic realism. So uh, this is a phrase that I don't come across that often. Um, and when I do come across it, it's used in different ways. So um, within the philosophy of science, semantic realism, I would take to just be the view that scientific theory should be interpreted literally. Uh, so there, there, there are some people who take it that the way to un that, that really scientific theories um, what when they postulate what seem to be uh, unobservable entities like electrons and so on um, really you should take these statements like statements about electrons as either just being you know, meaningless or as um, being reducible to statements about observables so you know uh, claims about electrons would you know reduce to claims about say tracks in cloud chambers and other things that we can actually observe um, but there's no but on this view you know you, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be taking the theory to even be attempting to describe a, an unobservable reality now this kind of position uh, is I mean I, I don't think there's really anybody defending this position these days I mean Daryl Robottom defends something a bit like it but in a much more limited context um but yeah i mean like most i mean pretty much everybody in philosophy of science now is a semantic realist in the sense that they think that um yeah the at least most of the claims that scientific theories make about unobservables should just be interpreted literally so when scientists talk about electrons they you know really are talking about uh, these unobservable constituent like it's it's not something to be reinterpreted we just take it literally um, there's also semantic realism in philosophy of language and I think that the way this is used there is that somebody who is so someone who's a semantic realist about uh, some discourse will say that all of the sentences of that discourse are either true or false even if we have no way even in principle of determining whether or not they're true or false so um, something can be true or false even if there is in principle no way for us to acquire any proof or evidence of the of its truth or falsehood um, and so so suppose for instance that we were able to prove that some mathematical conjecture cannot be shown to be either true or false right like we, we, we could prove that this is there's just no method by which we can show uh, whether or not some theorem is, is true or false. Well, a semantic realist would say it has a truth value, right? It's either true or false. We just don't know what that truth value is. Whereas a semantic anti-realist would say uh, no, right? In that case, 
it has no truth value. It's neither true nor false. Um, the semantic anti-realist would say that all truths are in principle knowable, whereas a semantic realist will say there are some truths that even in principle are not knowable. I think those are the ways the term semantic realism is used. You also ask, in logic, we use the phrase material implication. What is the significance of the term material in that phrase? I have absolutely no idea. I don't know why uh, that is called material implication. Um, I mean, other than that it's just used to di obviously distinguish it from other types of implication, but why it is called material implication in particular, I do not know. Um, uh, Bebby the Crazy uh, asks, can you react to the a song for the Kane B video? Um, yeah, good stuff. Thanks for that. Um, I kind of did react to it. I, uh, I left a comment. And um, so that, that was... Uh, that was very nice. Nobody's ever done me a song before, so I appreciate it. Uh, Bistful asks for my views on philosophy of mind. I have already answered that question earlier, uh, so I will link that in the description. Bicky, why don't you like Plato? Um, I, I mean, I don't really like any uh, <laughs> any philosophy from before like 1900, um, except David Hume, of course. I mean, I guess, and Sterner. And there are some philosophers I like from before 1900, but very, 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 very few. Like, I'm, I mean, my orientation is very contemporary. I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't get any joy from reading most philosophers from the past. And Plato in particular, I mean, I, like, he held a lot of ridiculous positions, but they weren't, like, ridiculous in an interesting way. Um, they were just kind of stupid. I mean, like, he, he had... I mean, his arguments are just really dumb. Um, he's wrong about everything. He's a terrible writer. Um, I, I mean, I don't blame him, right? He was living at a time when nobody knew anything back then. And, um, and <laughs> yeah, but I mean, s seriously, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't think of anything good about Plato. I, uh, at least it's been a while since I've read him. I was, I was sort of forced to read him in when I did my degree, I, I hated it. I absolutely hated every second of it. I thought it was a complete waste of time. I still feel that way. I don't think I got anything out of reading Plato. Um, I w it would have been better if I'd done something else w during that course, right? Like it, it just, it was just a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, if you're interested in ancient philosophy, then, you know, knock yourself out, like go and read Plato by all means. But I, I wasn't interested in it and it, it didn't do anything to um, inform my thinking about the things I was interested in. Um, borders. Scientific and moral anti-realism are often met with a kind of incredulity. Doesn't that mean scientific theories are no better than folk stories? Doesn't that mean we can't prefer certain social arrangements? Why do you think that is and how, how do you best like to respond in those sorts of situations? I mean, I must say, I, I haven't really encountered that with moral anti-realism. Um, I think that there's actually quite a lot of uh, sort of folk moral anti-realism. Um, I mean, it's something that that you often hear philosophy teachers complain about. Actually, is that like when uh, when the the students, like undergraduate students, first start studying ethics or they first start studying metaethics, it's uh, a source of annoyance to at least some uh, philosophy instructors instructors that the students just tend to say, well, you know, this is just all like a matter of opinion there's not really any fact of the matter about it um you know different people have different morals and you know that like nobody's right or wrong about this um it it really uh, yeah some some philosophy instructors get very wound up about that um so i think there's quite a lot of just yeah anti-realism is just kind of in the air you know um so i don't often meet people who are incredulous about it uh i guess I guess it depends on, um, you know, the, uh, the the sort of circles that you move in. I, I can imagine if, if you're among, like, uh, more religious people, say, then maybe they would be <laughs> incredulous. But, um, yeah. Um, so, I don't... Because I don't encounter that much, I, I don't really have a, a sort of stock response. Uh, now, as for scientific anti-realism... Yeah, I've I've encountered some of that, um, like people who just don't get it. I think that uh, it, it, part of it is that there is a kind of um, 
I mean, at least in my experience, when I've encountered this, I think it, it, sometimes it's just like a kind of anti-intellectualism. You know, there's just a, wh whenever I've encountered this, it has seemed to me to be a product of people just refusing to engage with the arguments, um, refusing to even attempt to understand the position charitably. Um, like the, the attitude isn't just like, oh, well, this doesn't interest me. The attitude would be it's a waste of time for anybody to even think about this. Um, or it's like actively dangerous for people to uh, make these claims, you know. So they'll, if you if you try to sort of present scientific anti-realism to uh, certain groups of people, uh, they will often confuse it with they'll confuse anti-realism with anti-science, you know. The, the, the ironic thing about this is, of course, is that the kind of people who are like most viciously against scientific anti-realism are people who see themselves as, um, you know, really, really pro-science. Of course, if they understood anything about science, then, you know, <laughs> they would know that uh, actually anti-realist uh, attitudes have been quite prevalent among scientists throughout the history of science. You know, look at physicists around the quantum revolution. Just look at what some of them were saying about that. Or when, you know, in the early days, certainly uh, of um, uh, uh, debates uh, in genetics, a lot of the geneticists were just straightforward anti-realists. Um, you know, anti-realist anti sentiments have been quite popular among scientists at various times throughout history. Um, and I mean, not so much these days, but I think that's probably just because scientists these days in general um, engage less with philosophy. I think there's been, you know, an increasing uh, uh, specialisation. Um, so the, the sort of philosophical motivations for adopting anti-realism are, are going to be less moving now. Um, but, you know, even even relatively recent scientists, I think, will sometimes express more uh, anti-realist or instrumentalist attitudes. Um, I have been told, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is true, because, you know, it's not a field that I move in, but um, I have been told that among string theorists, for instance, there's often an attitude of shut up and calculate, which is kind of an anti-realist attitude, right? That's kind of an instrumentalist approach. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I guess I guess actually that answers both. Right. Why do I think that is and how do I best respond? Um, my, my response would be, you know, look, I think that you are you're misunderstanding the position. And actually, if if you if you think that science is interesting, then, you know, maybe you should actually just go and read a bit more about it. And you'll see that <laughs> there are lots of scientists who have had anti-realist sentiments about what they were doing. Um, so, yeah. Um, what is something outside of philosophy that you are currently or would like to learn slash get better at? Do you have other academic interests you would like to further pursue? Oh, I mean, there's lots of stuff. I'd, I'd like to know. Uh, I'd like to know more about biology, about astronomy, um, about the arts. Uh, I, I mean, I'd like to do art. I wish I was able to like do art myself. I did once sort of dip my toe into digital art um and uh but you know I, I never really continued pursuing it um i again i've I've done you know music i've played instruments i can play didgeridoo that sort of thing but i really wish that i had time to uh become good at this stuff i mean i'm not good at any of this stuff uh also other languages i really would like to learn uh german uh and you know the click languages um, like the, uh, is it called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Zosa or Hosa, I'm not, X-H-O-S-A, I think it's spelled, uh, with the with the click, they make the clicking sounds. That would be really cool to know, um, one of those languages. So, I mean, none of this is ever going to happen, but um, those are things that, yeah, if, if like I had an extra 100 years in my life, maybe I would pursue one of those. Okay, uh, Brass asks, who would you say is your closest thing to an academic rival? By rival, I mean someone who holds completely different positions compared to you, um, especially when it comes to positions you care about, but whom you have a grudging uh, respect for. Um, so I think that uh, my initial inclination on this question is David Lewis. I mean, I really love a lot of Lewis's work. I love On the Plurality of Worlds. I would put that in my 
top 10 favorite philosophy books. But Lewis, as far as I'm concerned, comes to completely the wrong conclusions about everything. Um, and his, it's not just that he comes to the wrong conclusions, but his methodology, right? Like the, the, the way he thinks that we should do philosophy is just utterly, utterly misguided. Um, you know, his, his whole approach to metaphysics, his appeal to like common sense and intuitions, the way that he, he kind of, it's like he applies this kind of inference to the best explanation, right? Um, but what he takes to be, I mean, so first of all, I reject inference to the best explanation in general, right? But, but even if I were to accept it, right, like the way that Lewis applies it, what he takes to be explanatory virtues, like he thinks that it's an explanatory virtue when a metaphysical theory is in accordance with common sense um, or in accordance with our intuitions, you know, that kind of thing. It's, um, I think it's just hopelessly, hopelessly misguided. But, you know, he um, is a really good writer. And I mean, he he's the best at that kind of philosophy, right? There's a lot of philosophers who are doing that kind of thing. I think Lewis was just the best at it. And uh, so I, I really enjoy his work. Um, of course, it seems a bit odd for me to say, like, who's your academic rival? Oh, yeah, David Lewis. I mean, <laughs> like that seems... Um, <laughs> I feel like my rival, you know, should be somebody more on, on my level, you know, like I shouldn't really be naming David Lewis as my, my rival. Like I, uh, that's, it's kind of, kind of like, um, I don't know, a, a five-year-old being put into a boxing ring with like the world heavyweight champion or something, you know, <laughs> uh, that doesn't quite fit, but I, that was my initial reaction. Um, Daniel Barboza asks, uh, any opinions on antinatalism? So my, yeah, I've got a few, a few problems with antinatalism. I think that, uh, I mean, it's something I'm kind of sympathetic to. I think I'm more sympathetic to it than other people. And certainly in practice, I, I'm very much an antinatalist because there's no circumstances whatsoever under which I will reproduce. Um, but, uh, why uh, why I reject it. So the kind of line that I take on this is that at least one of the primary functions of, of morality is the construction of rules to uh, promote the long-term self-interest of rational agents, right? Um, so, you know, a simple example would be something like, let's say everybody uh, it, everybody's like using a field, you know, we all like to go out for walks on a field. I like to go out for walks on this field. But uh, I realize, you know, oh, hang on a minute, right? If, if all of us keep walking on this field whenever we want, that's going to degrade the field, it's going to ruin it. And then um, none of us will ever have access to this good field because the field won't exist anymore. So what do we do? Well, we, you know, we come to a compromise. We say, hey, why don't we all uh, accept a constraint on our behavior? You know, we'll, we will all accept the constraint that um, each of us uses the field only once a week. OK. Uh, and then that ultimately makes all of us better off. OK, so that's a you know, very simple example, but you hopefully see the point. Right? I'm accepting a constraint on my behavior um, in a way that if everybody else accepts the same constraint, this promotes my long term self interest interest. Now, how does this apply to antinatalism? Well, it would be bad for me and it would be bad for the majority of other people who do exist if we all decided to stop reproducing. Um, because, I mean, that would uh, sooner or later kind of destabilize society, right? Like if we don't have, if, if everybody accepted this rule, well, um, you know, we, we, wouldn't we wouldn't be replacing the population and without a sufficient number of um, younger, um, younger people, uh, people who can work without a sufficient number of them, you wouldn't be able to take care of the elderly and the ill, right? The welfare systems would collapse. Um, so this rule, like do not reproduce, that's not exactly optimal from the point of view of the people who do exist. Um, in fact, that's, that's kind of a, a shitty rule. <laughs> yeah, again, if everybody adopted that. Now, what I, what I would say, of course, is that, I mean, I don't have much motivation to um, uh, 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 argue against antinatalists because, number one, I mean, there's no way that you're actually going to convince, 
even like one percent of the population to do this i mean the, the the drive to reproduce is just too strong you know uh, it's it's not you're not going to dislodge that with philosophical arguments i mean in the vast majority of cases maybe there'll be a few people who you can get get them to change their minds but like in the vast majority of cases um people just they want to reproduce you know you're you're up against like four billion years of evolution here it's it's you're not going to make much of a dent on reproduction um and the the other thing is is that actually uh if you could make a dent in that it would actually be quite a good thing because we're currently you know overpopulated i mean we probably do need to get the population down so for these reasons i i mean i'm i'm actually quite happy with with antinatalism um let's promote it but it's not i, I just i can't yeah i can't get over that point i i i don't accept it myself um it also sort of feels a bit uh, i mean at the end of the day like i really love existing and from my point of view i mean you can give me whatever philosophical arguments you want right as far as i'm concerned my not coming into existence would have been i i mean just thinking about that kind of fills me with uh with with sort of this this sense of dread right like i, I even thinking of the like a world in which i don't exist um, which is obviously going to happen sooner or later because I will die. Um, <laughs> but, but but even thinking about a world in which I never came into existence at all, it, it fills me with horror. Um, uh, so you know, I uh, I value my own existence quite a lot. Uh, so it would it would just I think it would be I I'd feel a sort of you know my beliefs and values would be out of. You know, they'd be fractured. My psychology would be fractured if I came to accept antinatalism. That's how it feels to me, you know, because I really love existing, like really love it. And I want it to just carry on forever. Um, and on the other hand, if somebody doesn't love existing, you know, suicide uh, is is an option. Uh, so, yeah, um, for these reasons, I, I guess I'm not uh, uh, inclined towards antinatalism. Okay, uh, uh, Deud Matter asks, what is the most serious challenge to structural scientific realism and how could a realist respond to it if possible? Um, I, uh, I think I would probably say um, most serious challenge. So a challenge that's specific to structural realism um, that, that tends to, that I find quite persuasive is the problem of I guess the general problem of distinguishing structure and content um, in a way that, so we, we need to uh, identify what counts as structure in a way that is uh, prospectively, prospectively applicable. Uh, like we need to know um, what counts as the structure of our theories today, uh, because, um, but, so it's it's one thing to sort of look back in the past and say, oh yeah, well, these were the things that were retained uh, from theories in the past. So that counts as the structure of theories, right? But we need a criterion that number one, makes the distinction between structure and content. Uh, number two is such that it picks out the parts of past theories that were retained. And uh, number three, is such that it is applicable uh, today to our present theories, so that we can we can actually make the distinction between structure and content in our present theories, uh, and we can show that, that structure has been retained through the history of science. Uh, and then, of course, it also needs to be the case that um, there's reason to take this to be revealing unobservable structure, right? So uh, I, I suspect that in many cases, part of the reason why uh, we say that structure is retained is because structure can often be elaborated in terms of empirical structure. Um, it's like, well, you know, if you look at, say, Newtonian laws or something, well, I mean, of course they were retained because they accommodate empirical regularities. They accommodate observable regularities. So, like, if a science has successfully captured observable regularities, then obviously there is going to be some structure that is retained. Like no matter how much the uh, underlying theory changes, right, that structure will be recoverable in later theories because it's like, <laughs> again, it's, it's accurately capturing observables. So um, 
you know, <laughs> it's it's like, yeah, we, we need to do, uh, I think, quite a lot of work. Um, I mean, it, have I have I listed just one problem there or are there several? Um, no, I think I think there's just one general problem, right? The general problem is distinguishing structure and content in a way that's prospectively applicable and in a way that makes it actually count as realism, because there are anti-realist structuralists. I mean, Bas van Frassen um, these days calls himself an empiric what is it? Structural empiricism, right? Or empiricist structuralism. It's one of those two. I forget which way round he puts it. Um, yeah, I mean, like, if you if you if you read uh, Worrell's original paper on this, I mean, he sometimes suggests that structural content is like literally just a matter of um, equations and mathematical relationships. But you know, obviously. Uh, equations and mathematics needs to be interpreted and there's lots of different ways of uh, th there's lots of different ways of kind of recovering the mathematics and the equations from a theory um, these these things can be true of many things right so the equations can be true of many things uh, we might take them to be equations which are describing unobservable structure or we might just say well they they are accommodating uh, structures in the observables Obviously, an anti-realist is going to have no problem with that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that the general sort of structuralist idea that, like, equation and mathematical formalism and that will, will be retained somehow, uh, somewhere in future science, uh, is not really that threatening to an anti-realist. Um, and so the, the challenge is just to make the distinction in such a way that we can show that the history that over the history of science structure is retained um, that we know what counts as the structure of present theories and structure uh, tracks um, you know, we're talking about unobservable structure structure beyond just what we observe so um, with all of that said I mean I guess the main challenge is just to yeah like elaborate structural realism um, show that it's a distinctive position um, and and how do how do structural realists respond? Well, they re they respond by I don't know, just the, you know, look, looking at the history of science, um, working out the theoretical foundations of the position. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I think I think that answers the question. Hopefully, um, decrepitude asks, will you ever do a video regarding Kuhn and his par paradigm on the scientific revolutions? Well, I already have. Um, at least I have an introductory uh, video on Kuhn. Um, if you type in, well, if you just look at my Philosophy of Science series, I've got a couple of videos on Kuhn. I can't remember exactly what I titled them. Uh, will I do more? Well, probably not. And the main reason is just that I think Kuhn is kind of outdated now. Like Kuhn's theory of scientific change is it's sort of irrelevant these days. <laughs> like we know that it, it doesn't really apply. I mean, even in the sort of central cases that Kuhn was talking about, it's questionable whether it applies. Like, it's questionable whether it applies to, you know, the Copernican revolution and so on. But, I mean, certainly there are just countless cases from the history of science that don't really fit Kuhn's model. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're just looking at Kuhn for the uh, uh, more sort of philosophical claims, then th there are still interesting things to be said there. You know, the um like the the general claims about like science as uh, as often involving a kind of puzzle solving um the, the the ideas that he had about like truth and relativism and so on i mean that that's obviously still influential but the more specific model um of you know scientists uh agreeing on a particular paradigm um and then anomalies emerging and then incommensurable paradigms being proposed and all of that stuff. Um, I think we've sort of moved beyond that now. Um, DC, is it your position that abstract objects exist and if they exist, how would that influence positions with respect to philosophy of mind? Well, I think, well, no, ab abstract objects don't exist. I think abstraction is just something that, that we do. I, I have no idea how that influences positions with respect to philosophy of mind. I don't know how abstract objects come up in that context. Um, I mean, abstract objects are uh, non-spatiotemporal, non-causal, uh, etc. They don't, like, they're not 
objects that physically exist. You know, they're not like, yeah, they, they don't have like ca causal and spatial temporal properties. So um, they don't interact with minds, at least not causally. So I don't know. I, I have, I've never heard of, um, I, I, of this. Maybe I'm missing something obvious here, but I, I really don't know what this is in reference to. Um, Dimitri Dewey Jave, uh, what do you think about constructive mathematics of Markov Jr? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, why aren't you a Platonist? How do you respond to Platonistic arguments? Um, that's why am I not a Platonist? Well, I'm an empiricist, uh, is the simple answer to that. Um, how do I respond to Platonistic arguments? I mean, it depends on the argument. I I, I, I feel like this is, I mean, what, I, I, I can't go through all of the Platonistic arguments and respond to all of them. So um, I think that the general problem that I have with Platonism is um, kind of an obvious one, right? It's the problem that I think pretty much every anti-Platonist has, which is, look, the Platonist is interpreting the discourse um, such that it, so it, the, the Platonist interprets discourse about mathematics as being discourse that produces knowledge of mathematical facts but then she gives us a picture of mathematical facts that like cuts us off from access to those facts right so if you're imagining so if you're supposing that mathematical entities are abstract objects um that like <laughs> really exist but they have that you know they're non-causal with no spatiotemporal properties well then how on earth can we have any access to them you know um so i i think like that's the standard sort of problem it's the standard epistemological concern of how we are supposed to access uh these entities how we're supposed to be in a position to get true beliefs about these entities um and yeah, I mean, that's something that I think would be my fundamental concern about Platonism as well. Um, so that's just a general worry, the same general worry that I think everybody else has. Okay, Dominic S asks, what's your opinion about philosophical zombies? Do you think they are conceivable and metaphysically possible? And more generally speaking, do you think that some kind of property dualism is plausible? All right, well, property dualism first, because um, I can be very quick with this one. I don't know what property dualism is. I I can't even make sense of it in a way that I would be able to explain it to other people. Like, it's not just that I, I disagree with it. It's that I literally have, I, I can't make sense of, the, of what's being claimed. Um, so this is one reason, incidentally, why I stopped my Philosophy of Mind series all those years ago. And in the years since, I've never been able to understand, uh, come to a better understanding of property dualism. This was actually a problem when I was um, working as a teaching assistant, because although I never did philosophy of mind, I did do uh, courses that had some philosophy of mind in them. And I, I had students ask me about, like, oh, what's, <laughs> what exactly is property dualism? And I would, I would give the, the basic answer, you know, like, okay, there's one kind of substance with two distinct kinds of properties. And then obviously they would ask for clarification and I wouldn't be able to give any clarification because I don't know myself. So, uh, yeah. Mm, okay. I don't know. I can't say that probably dualism is plausible because I don't know what it is. Okay then, philosophical zombies, uh, are they conceivable and metaphysically possible? Um, a few problems with the idea of zombies. So the proposal is, we're to imagine, you know, something that has, that is exactly the same as us in terms of its physical properties, but it differs with respect to phenomenal properties because, you know, it just doesn't have any phenomenal properties, right? Um, I think that, I mean, first of all, to even begin talking about this, we need a conception of what exactly physical properties are. Um, I don't, um, I, I have problems with this. So if, we, if, we, if, if we're talking about physical properties and we ask what physical properties are, then, I mean, I guess a, a, a sort of usual way of approaching this would be something like, well, you know, physical property is, is you know, any property that is postulated in the sciences or is 
uh, supervenient on or reducible to properties postulated by the sciences. And maybe we want to say like our best sciences or something like that. Now, obviously, that's not quite right, because we know that current science is incomplete. Um, current science is likely to change in the future. So then we maybe would have to step back and say, well, OK, um, we're not defining physical properties in terms of present science. We'll define physical properties in terms of like ideal science. So it's properties that, that would be postulated um, by like the, the ideal science of the future when science is complete. Of course, the problem is we have no idea what that would be uh, or uh, if or when that would ever happen. Um, and also, I mean, it looks like we're probably going to want to allow that there might be, you know, science might have been different in various ways. There might be different things. So there might be properties that are not postulated by science, but that would still count as physical properties. Like it, it, we know, for instance, that the universe is not a Newtonian universe. Um, but presumably a Newtonian universe would still count as physical. So anyway, the, the one, one issue then is just with this problem of defining what exactly physical properties are. Um, because until you've got a good conception of that, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's tricky to even begin this discussion. Now, um, the other thing here is metaphysical possibility. I don't think there's such a thing as metaphysical possibility. I see possibility and necessity as being features of our models, not features of the world. I mean, frankly, I think like most empiricists, uh, metaphysical possibility is one of those things that I've, I've never really been able to make much sense of. Um, so I can make sense of the idea of like physical possibility uh, if we're thinking of possibility as constrained by scientific laws, um, like it's impossible to exceed the speed of light instance. I get that, right? Because our best scientific theories, well, it's not so much that nothing can go faster, it's that nothing can accelerate beyond it, right? But anyway, the point is that our, our best scientific theories right now uh, have that as like a, a speed limit. You know, that's a, that's a universal uh, constant, that's a speed limit. You cannot accelerate beyond it per what our best theories tell us. So, um, in the sense, so possibility in the sense of is constrained by physical law, fine. Um, but of course, I think most people would want to say, well, it may be physically impossible to exceed the speed of light, but it's not metaphysically impossible, right? Like there is some possible world in which uh, things things do exceed the speed of light. Um, I uh, I don't know what this kind of possibility could be. Um, because metaphysical possibility isn't just logical possibility, like right? we're not just saying that imagining a situation in which something at the speed of light is not contradictory, right? Um, so yeah, I, I have problems with all of that. Um, and then I also object to the idea that conceivability is any guide to the way the world is. So even if zombies are conceivable, and I'm not sure that they are, I mean, it depends on what you mean by conceivability, I suppose. But even if they are conceivable, I don't think I would draw any conclusions about that, about, you know, the metaphysics of the world. Um, I personally have difficulties conceiving of them. Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I feel like this this has been a bit of a ramble. But what you can get from this is that I don't really understand anything at any level in any of this argument, right? Like, I don't understand property dualism. I don't really understand what physical properties are supposed to be. I certainly don't understand metaphysical possibility. Um, I don't get any of this. This just all seems like nonsense to me. So um, that's my reaction. Um, don't you fucking ooh ooh me. Um, ask worst theory of truth. Dude, I have no idea. I don't even know what like the best theory of truth is. Worst, I don't know, coherence theory, maybe. Um, I always feel like that kind of misses the point. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I can't even I don't even know where to begin with that question. Like I know I don't know what like the worst theories in general are. You know, I have things that I that I like. 
there are, there are usually theories that I like in philosophical domains. But I'm not a very negative person, you know, I tend to be quite positive about things, so I don't tend to think about, like, the worst, you know, there's just stuff I disagree with. Um, but even the stuff I disagree with is uh, usually interesting in one way or another. I'm not actually that interested in theories of truth in general, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, why do most philosophers subscribe to moral and scientific realism? I think that it's because... <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I bought this chocolate bar, which I thought it was going to be like easier to eat it. It's quite a, it's got like a bit of like sort of toffee in it, and it's quite a, it requires a lot of effort to break off the bits. So it, I, I end, I thought I was just going to put it in and could talk while I'm eating it, but actually I can't. So that's annoying. Why do most philosophers subscribe to moral and scientific realism? I think it's because these are just the common sense positions. Um, and, uh, you know, philosophy for quite some time has um, operated on uh, with the sort of constraint that, <clears throat> you know, we should try to respect common sense. Like it's considered a theoretical virtue of a philosophical theory if the philosophical theory conforms with common sense intuitions. So insofar as it is just the kind of common sense picture of the world that, you know, there are moral properties, um, moral facts, that scientific theories um, provide true descriptions of reality, right? Insofar as that's part of the common sense position of the world, naturally that's going to be uh, found among many philosophers as well, right? Because we are literally uh, trying to generate theories uh, that conform to common sense. I mean, I say we, many philosophers are trying to do that. Um, also, there's just the recent turn towards uh, physicalism or materialism in metaphysics, right? I mean, that's a lot more hospitable to scientific realism. Um, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know which one causes the other one, right? Like, it might be that the antecedent commitment to scientific realism leads people to be physicalists, materialists, or maybe it's the other way around. I, um, I'm not sure, but certainly those two views, I think, tend to correlate, right? Like somebody who, who's a scientific realist is probably going to be more inclined towards a kind of physicalist position. So, you know, physicalism being popular in metaphysics. It, it seems like if you're going to be a physicalist, right, the best way of making sense of that is in terms of the sciences. So um, it's natural that those two things would, would go together. I guess physicalism is not so hospitable to moral realism, right? But um, it's certainly hospitable to scientific realism. There's, I think there's just a general view among philosophers that if anything uh, can tell us about the uh, structure and nature of the world, uh, it would be science. Um, like if you want to know how things work or uh, what, like what an object is composed of or like how its parts fit together, then what do you do? You ask scientists, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's probably what it comes down to. Uh, is there... God, this is... It's also like breaking... This chocolate bar is like breaking up as I eat it. This is not very convenient. Okay. Is there an idle problem in philosophy? I don't know what that means. Thoughts on Chesterton's fence argument? Oh, I'd never heard of that before. I did a quick Google and I, I, like, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a very interesting argument to me. I mean, I guess it's good to act with more information, but I don't really see why it would be required. I mean, if you've identified a problem and you've got a solution, I'm not sure why you would necessarily need to know all the information about, you know, why the thing that you're trying to change was constructed in the way that it was constructed. Um, that seems like it's going to sometimes be just irrelevant. So, yeah, I don't have a lot of thoughts on that. Hmm. In the common... 
in the conversation with perspective philosophy, you mentioned evolutionary debunking arguments. What are those and why do you find them plausible? So the idea of an evolutionary debunking argument, at least in the context of um, metaethics, is, look, we can explain why people hold moral beliefs without appealing to the idea that these beliefs are in any way tracking moral facts. So, um, so if, we do, if we're delivering an evolutionary debunking argument, then, um, you know, we're going to say, OK, morality, moral thinking emerged as a product of evolution. And in particular, uh, humans developed moral thinking because members of the groups that engaged in moral thinking tended to survive and reproduce more efficiently than people who didn't engage in moral thinking, right? But uh, the, the, the idea is that moral thinking is one of the tools that promotes social cooperation, and that obviously is to the benefit of everybody. It's a tool that um, is helpful for kind of enforcing regularity or uh, encouraging regularity in people's behavior. You know, like if you're if you have moral constraints on behavior, then you know you can be you can rely on other people to a greater extent. If you know that everybody's kind of following certain moral rules, then you know when I'm walking down the street, I'm less likely to just get mugged, etc. Um, so there are lots of benefits to thinking morally, and it seems like moral thinking might well promote survival and reproduction. But the key point is is that the moral facts make no difference to this, right? So it makes no difference whether killing people is morally wrong. Uh, we would believe that it's morally wrong, regardless of what the moral facts are, because um, like holding, so being in a society or being the kind of person who holds um, like values such that you are um, less likely to kill other people, uh, that actually promotes your own survival and reproduction, right? Being a, a sort of, you know, kind person who, who doesn't impose unnecessary suffering on others, obviously that will make people more likely to cooperate with you. So that promotes your own survival and reproduction. It doesn't matter what the moral facts are. Because of this history, people would have these moral beliefs anyway, right? So the general idea of a debunking argument is you want to show that the belief uh, that P, whether you know whatever whatever it may be, uh, the belief that P is explained by some process X, right? But X doesn't track the truth, so that makes so that means the belief that P is unjustified. Um, so by contrast, you know if you think about say um, perception, right? Our perceptual beliefs. Well, it seems like. Uh, we can also give an evolutionary explanation for perception. I mean, sure, surely we can. But in that case, it, it looks pretty plausible that it does track the truth. Because, um, you know, if you're, uh, I don't know, walking around the savannah and um, there's a lion in the bush, right? Um, then it makes sense that perception would give you accurate information about that. Uh, if you you know, if somebody like just wasn't aware of the lion, then um, that would make them much less likely to survive. So uh, in order to survive in the world, it looks like we need relatively accurate information about what the world is like, at least when it comes to, you know, everyday mid-sized objects that in the sort of everyday environments that we usually uh, uh, operate in. Um, that's arguably not the case with morality, right? Like whatever the moral facts are, if there are any moral facts, that's just irrelevant to the kind of moral values that people um, would have developed. I actually think that the evolutionary argument isn't quite as convincing as, uh, I guess, the, the sort of what we might call social debunking argument. I mean, an evolution, again, the point of a debunking argument is just you show that the belief that P is explained by some process X where X doesn't track the truth. So that can be evolution or it can just be like social forces, for instance. Um, so I, I think that if we're explaining um, moral thinking, then we probably will want to appeal to this evolutionary explanation somewhere in there. But I think social forces 
play a much greater role in terms of producing um, the, the sort of specific moral judgments um, that people make. But um, yeah, anyway, that's the, the general idea of evolutionary debunking arguments. Okay. When is it irrational to trust the scientific consensus on a given topic? Um, I don't know. This is a topic that I need to do more work on. So I, I don't want to say anything about that. It's a big problem. I haven't thought enough about it to say anything here. Rawls versus Nozick, why? Well, I vastly prefer Nozick. I mean, Nozick is um, much more entertaining. Nozick wrote, like, a huge amount on a wide variety of topics. It was all, always interesting. He was all, always prepared to like think through really radical ideas. I mean, Nozick endorsed some like really wild ideas. Um, and yeah, I mean, like Rawls is, is fine, right? Rawls is moral political philosophy. Nozick, he, he went into like moral political stuff and did amazing work, but he did amazing work on such a wide variety of things. And I don't know, maybe Rawls did as well. But if Rawls did, I haven't, I haven't read it. And so uh, I've actually read like a lot of Nozick and I always find him entertaining. I always find him really challenging. Um, I always love his, he's, he's able to just draw on such a wide variety of different like sources, you know, I mean, he was somebody who was quite up to date with, you know, the, the sort of latest sciences, the, the economics, um, and, and he'd always kind of, he'd, he'd draw on all of them um, in making his philosophical arguments. He was, um, he was really sort of promiscuous uh, in, in terms of his like engagement with other academic areas and always entertaining. So, yeah, I, I love Nozick. Nozick's like one of my top five philosophers and rules would be, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'd put rules, but like rules is just fine. You know, I know about rules just because everybody has to know about rules, but I don't really care about rules that much. So, you know, I, I like Nozick. Thoughts on David Deutsch's epistemology and philosophy of science. I don't know him. So I looked him up and, um, you know, I don't really have a lot of comments. I literally just had a look on his Wikipedia page. Apparently he's into the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. I just don't see any reason to believe that. Um, Popper's falsificationism is somehow tied into it as well. Well, you know, I think that that's a perfectly good idea, but has, you know, a lot of problems. It's not the whole story. Um, I I mean, I, yeah, I, I've never read this guy, but, um, there wasn't anything there that looked particularly appealing to me. Could there be applied epistemology in the same way that there is applied ethics? What would that look like? There already is such a thing as applied epistemology. Um, in fact, your question about when to trust scientific expertise, that is applied epistemology. And probably a lot of philosophy of science counts as applied epistemology. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, other questions would be, you know, under what circumstances is it rational to believe conspiracy theories, for instance, something which I did a uh, video about a little while ago. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, there is, there already is applied epistemology. Like epistemologists aren't just interested in kind of abstract questions about like the nature of knowledge. Like is knowledge justified true belief? Uh, or does it require other conditions? You know, what is the nature of rationality? Like, no, I mean, epistemologists will often um, kind of get their hands dirty, you know, they'll, they'll get into the uh, uh, more specific questions of like, you know, is is this particular thing? Like, is this is this rational? And yeah, I mean, so there, there already is such a thing as applied epistemology. Um, okay, what were some significant philosophical positions you changed your mind on? Well, when I first started thinking about philosophy, I was a kind of a standard materialist, physicalist. Um, I'm not that anymore. 
I was a scientific realist. I would have, uh, I guess, endorsed something like inference to the best explanation. Um, I was a realist about unobservables, realist about causality, realist about modality. Um, I was a realist about a lot of stuff, you know. Um, and I, I think I would have endorsed the idea of philosophy as a kind of continuation of science and specifically uh, uh, of metaphysics as a continuation of science. So, you know, not only so scientific theories give us true descriptions of reality, right? So this is the scientific realism. Um, but then we can actually go beyond scientific theories. We can use, you know, philosophical tools to go beyond scientific theories and learn, you know, even more about the nature of reality. Um, and in particular, uh, I, I mean, I say we, we use philosophical tools to do that. But what I would have said is, well, um, when we're doing metaphysics, we judge metaphysical theories um, via inference to the best explanation and the kind of explanatory virtues of, uh, uh, you know, simplicity and like coherence with other scientific theories and you know th these explanatory virtues it's the same way that scientists tend to operate like scientists i would have said apply inference to the best explanation um, in the case of science obviously scientific theories have virtues that metaphysical theories do not because scientific theories can be used to make predictions right but you don't just judge scientific theories in terms of uh, how accurate the predictions are, you also will judge them via criteria like simplicity. So my idea was that, yeah, we can do the same in metaphysics. Metaphysical theories um, are also judged by inference the best explanation, and those inferences might be riskier, but, you know, we, we make the best of what we've got, right? So, um, and, and I think this is, this is a, fa a fairly standard position among philosophers. So I was... I was a physicalist, I was a scientific realist, um, uh, I was very much into doing metaphysics uh, by the application of inference the best explanation. Now none of that is the case anymore, like all of that has been abandoned uh, due to my commitment to uh, a pretty hardcore empiricism. And this happened, um, I started to drift away from scientific realism at the end of my degree, because I did my dissertation on scientific realism, and I was intending to defend it, and I found that I just couldn't. Um, I found myself persuaded by the anti-realist arguments, and then once I'd abandoned scientific realism, you know, I suddenly found myself sort of lost in a way, because so much of what I had been doing in philosophy really required scientific realism, it required me to accept scientific realism, right? Like if you want to, if you want to do metaphysics, certainly in the way that I was doing it, um, you've got to be a scientific realist. Uh, and, and there are many other areas of philosophy where like, I would appeal to the best sciences um, and I would assume that they provided true descriptions uh, in order to defend positions that I was holding. So I did find myself a little bit lost for a while um, and, until I realised, you know, empiricism offers the answer. Uh, that offers a, a different way of doing philosophy and a different way of thinking about these issues um, that restores the coherence to my beliefs. So I think this would be the, the major shift that happened, was, would be my acceptance of, um, of empiricism. Some other things that have changed, well, I've definitely shifted from... Um, a kind of Nozickian right-wing libertarianism to um, left libertarianism. Um, more recently, I've shifted from non-cognitivism to error theory. I don't actually see that as a significant change, though. So, I mean, you said significant philosophical positions. I've changed my mind on. I actually don't. To me, the move from non-cognitivism to error theory is very, very minor. I do not see that as being a particularly uh, important change. Um, but a lot of people would consider that to be a significant shift. Okay, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Um, okay, uh, Eduardo C asks, favourite pieces and movements of art, if any, by medium? Um, all right, so film. Well, I don't really pay much attention to particular movements of film, and actually these days I 
don't really watch films just because I don't have I don't have time like I mean I do have time but generally speaking films are just too long you know I like to um, watch stuff when I eat my dinner and what I do is right I'll get the dinner ready I'll put on whatever it is I'm watching I'll start eating and then you know I, I have that sort of post eating glow you know but by the time that's over I want to move on and do something else now that usually takes up sort of at the most 45 minutes so a film is just too long right um, and and so I, I prefer watching TV programs uh, to films but I, I have seen lots of movies in the past and um, favorite favorite films well my favorite film is 2001 a Space Odyssey um, I think that I don't know I, I just just love it I love everything about it uh, <laughs> um, you know uh, it's it's obviously like got so many I, I I don't know I'm not really very good at talking about this stuff um, I can say that what I love about 2001 is that to me anyway I find it really emotionally moving and it's always surprising to me when people call Kubrick uh, a kind of cold and um, you know like emotionless sort of filmmaker because um, there really is nothing more moving to me than than 2001 you know you look at the scene where um, Hal is deactivated and in that whole scene almost nothing happens I mean there's there's like it's just somebody you know walking through a spaceship and then he gets to where Hal is and then he puts the key in and turns it and the computer things come out so there's very 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 little actually going on there's very little action yet it is absolutely gripping I mean it's that you know you feel like the tension even though I know what happens in the movie when I watch that scene now it I still feel this incredible sense of suspense and tension because you know you know that at this point Dave is it's just him and Hal right so when he ke when he gets rid of Hal he's completely alone he's gonna be completely alone just like way at the other end of the solar system um, and that sense of, of loneliness is just hanging over that scene. And it's suspenseful as well because it's like he's there and there's this crazy computer and who knows what this crazy computer will do. Now, as it happens, the crazy computer can't actually do anything. But even so, you still feel the suspense. And not only do you feel the suspense, it's really sad. Like Hal's uh, uh, monotone voice, Some it's, it, it almost makes it worse the fact that Hal is actually unable to express emotion because he's saying these things that are sort of simple and childlike almost. You know, like, I can feel my mind going and, you know, Dave, stop, and all of this. He's, he's trying to plead but unable to express his emotion. It's, it's terribly, terribly sad. So, you know, I mean, in this one scene, this one scene in which almost nothing happens, there's incredible emotional power in so many ways. It's suspenseful. Um, you know, it's desolate, it's sad, it's absolutely incredible. And I mean, that's just the deactivation scene. Obviously, that's not the scene that everybody remembers when they watch 2001. But, you know, this is the point. Like, the, the whole thing, for me, um, is just outstanding. So uh, that's, that's my favourite film. Um, a few others would be um, Wallace and Gromit, The Wrong Trousers, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Della Morte, Della More. Uh, which I think was called Cemetery Man in the US, which is a fucking stupid name. Della Morte Della More is a, a, a great name. Uh, Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, even though the TV series is absolute shit, in my opinion. Um, I love, love the movie. That was Lynch's masterpiece. Uh, I love anything by uh, Tarantino, Werner Herzog, anything involving Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, yeah, okay, so that, that's movies. Uh, um, other things. Um, m music. Um, Okay, favourite pieces of music. I don't really have favourite songs. Um, I do have favourite albums. Beefheart, Trout Mask, Repl Replica, uh, Steely Dan's Gaucho, um, Ryoji Aikida's Dataplex, John Oswald, Plexure. Um, uh, there's got to be some others. Uh, <laughs> okay, forget about albums. Um, Steve Reich, Sun Ra... Frank Zappa, Grateful Dead, Motorhead, Albert Eiler, Derek Bailey, Evan Parker. Those are some artists that I like. Oh, and John Cage. Obviously, John Cage. 
How could I forget John Cage? Uh, no, actually, favourite pieces of art, uh, John Cage's 433. Absolutely love that one. I did a video on that. Um, so, yeah, uh, 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 John Cage. I would say that uh, if we're talking about movements here, um, I love free improvisation. I love a lot of experimental classical, um, particularly, unsurprisingly, given the Cage thing, I love uh, aleatoric music, music incorporating chants. And I love that in art in general, like art that incorporates chants elements in its composition. Uh, I like a lot of stuff that's noisy and chaotic. Um, yeah, uh, so, oh, and I like a lot of uh, just 80s pop rock. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, um, I, just, I just do. But if I want something catchy, I'll go with uh, 80s pop. Um, what else? So, uh, okay, painting. Um, I like just abstract art in general, like abstract expressionism, lyrical abstraction. Uh, what's it called? Um, what's the name of the? There's there's like there's there's lyrical abstraction, and then there's the more kind of geometric type of abstraction. Is it literally just geometric abstraction? Uh, the point is, I like abstract stuff. Um, I also like. Uh, uh, Chiaroscuro, is that it? Chiaro scuro. That's not really a movement, it's a style. But you know, when you get the, the extreme differences in light and dark, I always I like that in paintings. Um, again, I know that's not a movement as such, but whenever paintings have that, I tend to like it. Um, I like a lot of glitch art, I like Dadaism. I don't know much about architecture, but I do like brutalist architecture. Okay, I think that provides something of an answer to that question. Uh, <clears throat> um, Emily Hu asks, what are the types of internships for philosophy? Well, I don't really know. I mean, when I did my PhD, I just worked as like a teaching assistant. Um, and that's just something that's offered to people who are doing PhDs. Beyond that, I'm not really sure. Uh, how do you make good reading notes for philosophy? How to summarise the readings into precise argument argument form? Hmm. Well, the thing is, is that whenever I, so I started the YouTube channel before I went to university, before I started studying philosophy formally. And what I, one of the reasons why I made this YouTube channel was because I found that the best way to learn something was to try to teach it to someone else. And that's something that I've, I've heard lots of people say. So, you know, I assume it's probably good advice, but like, uh, you know, it's it's a kind of common idea, like the best way to learn something is to get yourself into a position where you can teach it to others. So what I would do when I was trying to, you know, learn philosophy is I would just write out introductions. And these introductions were not designed to be read by anybody. They were literally just me trying to say to myself, like, OK, what would I say if I was trying to teach this to other people? And then, of course, I realised, oh, you know, I've got all of this material here. I might as well um, actually use it. I might as well put it out into the world. And then that was what prompted me to make the YouTube channel. But the point is this. Um, when it comes to um, making notes and, and like learning philosophy, you know, I'm not the kind I've never used. I've never really used notes, to be honest. Um, so I know that some people like to uh, uh, kind of um, condense their, like their, their, their work or whatever it is they're trying to learn into like quick notes. I've never really done that, right? For me, what I've always done um, is if I want to learn about a particular topic, I will literally just try to write an introduction to that topic in my own words. Um, and that's that's it. But the thing is, that's not going to work for everybody. You know, different people learn in in different ways. Um, <clears throat> so I I I feel like I, I never really like to give advice about this because you know I I don't know if this is really applicable to other people, right? It, you've got to figure out how you learn. But I can tell you how I did it, and that's that's how I did it. That's how I still do it. If I want to learn something, I will. <laughs> I'll read about it and then I'll just say to myself, all right, I'm going to try to teach this to other people. And in many cases, I actually end up 
actually teaching it to other people because I create videos from it. But um, yeah, that's um, that's all I can really say about that. Uh, so that's probably not very helpful, but um, that's as much as I can say, because as I say, I, I, I don't really know how other people learn. Um, that's just how I learn. Any suggestions for philosophy of science students? Um, what would I, what would I say to philosophy of science students? Uh, I don't know. I think the thing is, it depends on w like where they're coming from, right? So if somebody is coming to philosophy of science from a science background, I would have very different suggestions um, versus someone coming from to philosophy of science from a philosophy background. <clears throat> Because if somebody was coming to philosophy of science from a science background, then my suggestions would be just much more focused on kind of explaining what philosophy is about and how to do philosophy, or at least how to do the kind of philosophy um, that tends to happen in philosophy of science. Because I mean, philosophy of science, right, isn't science. It's it's philosophy mainly, right? So that's the the the, you know, the, the understanding you need is an understanding of philosophy, um, and if somebody with a science background comes into philosophy of science, then they're likely to make mistakes with respect to doing the, the philosophy, as it were. Um, so I don't really know if I do have any general suggestions. Um, mm, yeah, sorry about that, but I, I don't really have much to say there. <clears throat> Emmanuel Perez, what is time to you? Is it a real entity or an abstract entity that we humans made up to organise things in our life? I'm totally agnostic about the nature of time. I, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, so I can't say anything about this. I mean, I haven't even like read any philosophy of time, um, at least not in the last 10 years, you know. <clears throat> so I have, I, I mean, there is nothing I can say about this, I'm afraid. <clears throat> right, Ethan King 185, thoughts on free will. Uh, Stefan Travis also asks for my thoughts on free will, um, although with a slightly longer question. Um, wait a minute, what? Uh, yeah, so Stefan Travis um, asks, right, is free will like consciousness, person, or love an inherently fuzzy term from folk psychology? Um, one that it's a mistake to treat as a technical term. Do you think free will has a rigorous definition or could it be given one? So Ethan King asks for my thoughts on free will. Stefan Travis asks, do you think free will has a rigorous definition or could it be given one? Um, so, I mean, could it be given one? Well, yes, of course, uh, we can always give rigorous definitions of things. This is, uh, you know, this is a matter of conceptual engineering, right? I mean, uh, the question would be, if we did give a rigorous definition of it, would that definition capture all that we want from a concept of free will. Um, I mean, look, I I can only speak for myself here. Um, I think, you know, Dennett talks about like varieties of freedom worth wanting. And I'm kind of inclined to agree with that sort of perspective, right? I'm basically a compatibilist. Uh, we have all sorts of capacities uh, that make a difference. Um, capacities that are important to us, capacities that distinguish us from other uh, types of entities in the universe. You know, we have rationality, we have abstract thought, we are able to um, like reflect on our behaviour and change our behaviour in light of the reflections that we have made. Um, we have not just desires, but we also have second order desires. You know, we have desires about our desires. So if I, I desire the chocolate cake, but then I can think to myself, oh, wait a minute, um, not only do I desire this chocolate cake, I also desire to be healthy. And I know that if I just gorge on chocolate cake all the time, that will make me unhealthy. So I will overrule uh, that desire for the chocolate cake, right? And I can actually put some effort into making my desires the sort of, the, I can have the, make my desires the kind of desires that I want. I can shift my desires in different directions. Um, if I read enough about how unhealthy chocolate cake is, maybe I'll actually just stop desiring it so much. <clears throat> so, 
you know, there's all of these things that we can do. And there's no question that we do those things, right? It doesn't matter what the nature of the world is like. It doesn't matter whether the world is deterministic or indeterministic. There is no question that we have these capacities. Um, so um, I think that that's enough for free will, right? Like that's, I, I don't see why we would need anything more than that. Um, and in particular, you know, when it comes to the debate about determinism, indeterminism, I just think, like, why would it make a difference, right? Whether our actions are causally determined uh, or whether they're, you know, the product of random movements of particles somehow, you know? I mean, as the, um, as, as the people like Strawson, um, who are, who just reject free will, as they point out, uh, either way, right, whether the universe is deterministic or indeterministic, I mean, ultimately, right, our decisions can be traced back to events over which we have no ultimate control. I mean, we are all just products of, you know, a combination of genes and environment, right? I mean, that's, that's it, right? I mean, ultimately, well, a combination of genes, environment, and I guess maybe like random movements of you know, particles inside our brains. Um, so that's it. And, and on none of those things do we have any control. So um, it seems to me that like we either take the view that the very concept of free will is just incoherent, or we take a sort of compatibilist line and say, well, all that matters to free will um, are these things that are of like practical everyday significance, you know, these capacities for rationality and second order desires and so on. Um, and we have those things regardless of what the metaphysical facts are. I'm, I'm, I, I don't really care, right, whether we say that free will is incoherent or whether we take that sort of practical compatibilist line. It doesn't really make any difference to me. Um, I tend to go with the compatibilist line just because a lot of people seem to think that free will is important and like hey if you think this if you think this thing is important then i can i can give you something that you know plays the right role let's say um but uh yeah i i, I don't see that as a, as a hugely important distinction so i think that answers the question frog choir what do you think about zazan's idea about language creating barriers to thought and experience um, I think that we, okay, so so first of all, just on Zazanne in general, I mean, you've got to be very, very careful with Zazanne. He is extremely sloppy as a writer. Um, like, there's a lot of just straight out cherry picking going on in his work. I mean, so Zazanne seems to read a lot of the anthropological literature, but what he does is he just pay, he he just ignores everything except the most rosy depictions of the... Uh, uh, of, of the small scale societies that you know he's he's reading about right like I, I i mean it's yeah it's it's pretty ridiculous he's not very critical either like i mean he will often if you actually look at the sources that he appeals to i mean there's sometimes just like outright pseudoscience in there like there's just it's so you've got a, a kind of very selective reading of good anthropological literature mixed in with a bunch of pseudoscience. I mean, it's it's a, it's it's pretty appalling, right? Like uh, by any kind of reasonable academic standard. Um, also, I think you should bear in mind that Zazan's arguments are such that they don't really support his conclusions. So, um, if you think about this claim about language, for instance, well. What Zazan, Zazan will do, you know, is he will, uh, he'll like appeal to anthropological literature of society, concerning societies that are linguistic. Um, I mean, obviously, because all of the societies that we've ever studied uh, are linguistic, they use language. Um, so we don't actually have any anthropological evidence concerning human societies before language. But then he'll kind of move from that, he'll move from his very rosy picture of those societies, right, to a sort of claim uh, about what non-linguistic society would be like. And again, that's a that's a move which I think is not very well supported um, by any argument. Um, so anyway, about this general idea of, you know, language creating barriers to thought. Well, I would say that we just don't really have any idea what 
non-linguistic thought would be like. Uh, I mean, because all of our thoughts are like understood linguistically. I mean, I guess we can point to aspects of our current experience that um, that, that 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 kind of outstrip what we can express linguistically. So I'm thinking of things like colour perception, right? Like we can't really describe redness, but even colour perception is obviously strongly influenced by categorizations which are developed linguistically. Um, so the fact that we uh, have this categorization red, okay, that seems to be a product of, of our language. I mean, we know that there are different societies that categorize color differently, and that does affect um, the way in which they perceive color. Um, so we don't have, I, I just don't think we have any access to what non-linguistic experience would be like. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's, it seems to me quite difficult to say anything about this. Um, does language create barriers to thought? Well, the way I would put it actually is more that those barriers make thought possible. Um, you know, without, without some kind of categorization, um, you know, how do you, there's just no way of making sense of the world, right? Like there's, there's the, uh, the, the blooming buzzing confusion. Was it, was that William James who said, you know, blooming buzzing confusion, like experience without any kind of conceptualization would be a blooming buzzing confusion. Um, and I, I think actually as well, uh, it seems to me quite likely that non-linguistic thought probably does the same thing. I mean, like we don't, we may not know uh, exactly what it would be like to, th to have non-linguistic thought. Um, but surely, it, it, I mean, it seems like animals, you know, conceptualize the world and carve up the world um, in some sort of way. Uh, so uh, even, even without language, there are still going to be these uh, barriers, as you, as you put it. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I also think that it's just kind of, like irrelevant, practically speaking. I mean, we're not going to get rid of language. Like that's just not going to happen. As long as you have humans, um, we're, we're going to have language. So uh, it's <laughs> maybe academically interesting, but um, of no real practical uh, uh, relevance. Okay, Full Wonder uh, asks, what do you think of the cosmological arguments for God based on the principle of sufficient reason? Well, I don't accept the principle of sufficient reason. Um, I'm an empiricist. So, you know, no surprise there. Uh, even if I did accept the principle of sufficient reason, I, I don't think that would be a very good argument for God because uh, there are lots of other ways to account for the existence of the universe. Um, or at least I think there are. Um, you know, I think there are like quite, quite plausible ways of... But if you're, if you're going to go in for that kind of metaphysics, right, uh, which I don't, but if you want to go in for metaphysical speculation, I think there are lots of ways of, uh, of of showing, you know, why something exists, why the universe exists, that do that do not require postulating God. Um, also, many of the cosmological arguments for God depend on claiming things. They depend on making claims about the modal properties of the universe. So they'll they'll make the claim, for instance, that like the universe is contingent. So um, where this is supposed to be a property of the universe itself. Now, I don't think there are any modal properties. Um, I don't think any object is necessary or contingent. Uh, these modal properties are features of our theories, not features of the world as I see it. Um, so I think that cosmological arguments fail on almost every level. Um, Guardian do Dragon. What are your thoughts on logical positivism and Quine's critique of the analytic synthetic distinction? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the logical positivists. I'm a pretty hardcore empiricist myself. So, you know, in so far, so they've, they've, their spirit was right. You know, they, they, we share the same spirit, but um, I'm inclined to agree with the consensus that positivism was at its heart fundamentally misconceived. I mean, first of all, they, develop their philosophy on the basis of a theory of meaning, right? Um, and I think the problems with metaphysics really have nothing to do with 
meaning. I mean, I, I think metaphysical claims are generally perfectly meaningful. Um, and the problem with them is just that they're not well supported. Uh, they're not properly justified. Um, so this obsession with meaning led to a lot of fruitless debates. I mean, it, what, like the, trying to kind of work out the verification criterion, trying to uh, uh, sort of save the verification criterion from all of the uh, obvious problems that it faces. I think that was just kind of a waste of time. Um, and the fact that the positivists sort of took that as being the, the heart of their philosophy was, was a big mistake. I also think that they were um, mistaken in terms of uh, their commitment to um, classical logic and more broadly the idea of like there being rules of rationality, right? Rules of, of reasoning. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that there are lots of problems with positivism, but this isn't particularly controversial, right? I mean, positivism's dead. So, you know, uh, I, I, I don't have anything particularly new to say there. Um, as for Quine's critique, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the Quinean web of belief idea. Uh, I'm not myself sure that we can make sense of the analytic synthetic distinction, um, or at least if there is an analytic synthetic distinction, I'm not really sure it's that important. It's certainly not something that really comes up in my work. Like, I, I mean, it doesn't seem to come up in my work uh, even as something that I criticize, right? Like, I just don't talk about it that much. Um, I, I don't think I've ever written an essay uh, where the analytic synthetic distinction has actually mattered. So, <laughs> you know, um, it, it just doesn't seem that important to me. Quine's critique of it, well, I'm, I'm not, I don't particularly like the argument here, mainly because his critique seems to be an argument by elimination. I should say, just incidentally, it's been a while since I've read Quine's paper and, and maybe I'm forgetting something, but that's pretty much what he does, right? Like he says, you know, here's a bunch of ways in which people have tried to define the analytic synthetic distinction, but none of them really work. Um, oh, and it turns out that in order to make sense of the analytic synthetic distinction, you have to make sense of a whole bunch of other like concepts, which I find questionable concepts like necessity and synonymy and so on. Right. So uh, and he says that like none of these um, can be defined in any clear or precise way. Now, the problem with this sort of argument is that it seems to me that you can do exactly the same thing with basically every interesting philosophical concept. Right. Like you can do the same with the concept of knowledge. Isn't that pretty much what epistemologists have been doing for the last 50 years? You know, people have been proposing definitions and then other people have been saying, oh, no, these definitions don't work for these reasons. Right. Or, you know, that somebody will propose a definition and, and then someone else will say, well, you know, you actually that definition is only acceptable if you accept uh, this other concept, which I find questionable, you know, so. I think that with any philosophically interesting concept, uh, it's possible to make that kind of argument by elimination. What I think Quine has shown is that, um, all right, there's 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 a question about how exactly we define the analytic synthetic distinction, and maybe we don't have a clear definition of that. But um, that that I don't think shows that the distinction should just be rejected, right? Like there are still going to be lots of um, kind of c clear cases, let's say. And um, we're still going, like, we can still appeal to this distinction in, in our work if it's, if it comes up and it's relevant in the same way as, you know, I can do work and appeal to the concept of knowledge, even though there isn't really any consensus on what exactly uh, that is. Um, also, I mean, just as a more general point, I, I'm, I, I tend to uh, approach philosophy from the point of view of conceptual engineering. So um, I'm less interested in working out like what exactly the conditions of application for particular concepts are, um, and more in saying, well, what can what kind of useful work and what work is this concept doing, and you know, can we come up with a definition that is sort of more precise and um, you know, simple and that still does all of the useful work. And so, yeah, just just in general, like it's not really a problem for me if um, it turns out that a concept is 
incoherent because we can just fix it and you know replace it with a more coherent concept. But anyway, yeah. So I, I, I um, I'm not really that persuaded by Quine's critique, at least if that critique is being proposed as a reason to abandon the analytic synthetic distinction. Even though I myself don't seem to care that much about the analytic synthetic distinction. Um, you also ask about what Chalmers calls meta metaphysics. Uh, I I don't really know. I've I've not looked into that, so I have nothing to say about that. Um, Glaucon wrongs. I dropped out of a philosophy graduate program seven years ago. Terrible job market. <sighs> Terrible job market uh, appeared to make continuing foolish. I now went. I went to law school and am now doing very well. Do you have any backup plans after your PhD? Should the job market not pan out? Uh, I have no backup plans whatsoever. Um, I am not expecting it to pan out, uh, but I don't have any other plans because I don't make plans. I'm uh, I, I live entirely in the in the moment, and I have no future plans whatsoever. Um, but I'm not expecting to get an academic career. I mean, that would be crazy at this point. Uh, partly because the job market, as you say, uh, is terrible, and obviously with coronavirus, it's pretty much collapsed. The other thing is, is that I'm not actually like. I'm not actually that good as an academic. So I'm good at philosophy, but I'm a terrible academic. I, I don't go, so even before coronavirus, I like never went to conferences. I never even went to like seminars and, and stuff. I, I just didn't care. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I tended to just sort of be alone. I was, I was very, very bad at the networking side of things. And you need to be good at networking in order to succeed in these kinds of fields. Um, I'm also not that good at publishing. I hate publishing. Like it's it's a it's an absolutely miserable process. The, the, I mean, honestly, right. The truth is, is that when I was younger, I wanted to become an academic philosopher, but having actually had experience of academia, it, it isn't even something I really want anymore. You know, I'm I'm happy. I I think I would prefer it if I could just get a job in a in some other field and then you know do philosophy in my spare time like i'm always going to do the youtube channel but academia is 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 a miserable miserable place and um so i i don't really care that it's not going to pan out it won't pan out and i'm not even that bothered about that anymore um maybe or maybe this is just sour grapes who knows um henrik munch how does the constructive empiricist make a clear distinction between observables and unobservables? If it is in fact a vague distinction, do we run into a Sorites type paradox? I don't really see why vagueness would be a problem here. Um, at least I don't see why it's a problem specific to the constructive empiricist. Uh, so yes, um, if it's a vague distinction, and I'm inclined to think that it is vague because I'm inclined to think that basically all distinctions are vague, then it will be subject to Sorites type paradoxes. But of course, those paradoxes arise because of the fact that it's a vague distinction, right? Those are just a product of vagueness. So you can apply whatever solution you use in other contexts. So if you accept a supervaluationist solution to the uh, problems of vagueness, well, you can apply that solution here. Um, I think that the uh, uh, problem of vagueness and the, the resolution of the Sorites type paradoxes is just a matter for philosophy of language. And I'm, I'm not, I, I don't see this as really being a, a, an issue for the constructive empiricist. Okay, as for the uh, observable, unobservable distinction. So here's how I draw it. And this is not the way that all empiricists will draw it, but I'll tell you how I draw it. So obviously the basic idea is... Um, you know, observability is kind of tied to the unaided senses, right? Like that's the basic case. Anything that we perceive, right, is going to count as observable. Any property that we perceive will count as an observable property. Now, I think that when it comes to instruments, actually, there are some instruments that, that, that do uh, sort of extend our perception in a sense. There are certain, and this is the case when instruments provide a kind of direct access. So someone like Van Frassen, right, he's more extreme than I am, right? He will deny that, like, that we observe through any scientific instruments. But even Van Frassen um, is, I think, quite happy to say that people observe through um, magnifying glasses, for instance. 
So there are certainly some instruments that uh, extend perception. Um, and the way that I draw the distinction between instruments that we observe through and instruments we don't is, is this way. Um, there are some scientific instruments that can function only through the creation of artifacts, right? So they only provide access to the world via the creation of some other physical object. So think of, say, an atomic force microscope. When you use an atomic force microscope, this will create an output. It will be a literal material object. I mean, presumably an image. It wouldn't necessarily have to be an image, right? But, um, you know, I guess it would probably be like an image on a computer screen. It wouldn't necessarily have to be that. I suppose the information could be communicated in all sorts of ways. It might produce, I don't know, sound as an output, uh, or it could produce, you know, some sort of braille that you touch. Um, but it's, you know, going to be an artifact. And so you only um, access the information that it produces via accessing this physical artifact. Now, that's not the case for, say, an optical microscope or for a magnifying glass, for that matter. Um, when you use an optical microscope, you just have a system of lenses um, that magnify the object. So, you know, if I look at an object through uh, a, an optical microscope, I might see a mitochondrion, let's say, mitochondrion in a cell. Now, nowhere in any of this is there a physical artifact that represents the mitochondrion, right? It's not like you know, within the lenses of the optical microscope, there is uh, literally a picture, like a drawing of a mitochondrion. Okay, it's no, we just look through the microscope and that's what we see. So atomic force microscopes produce artifacts and then we can ask of those artifacts, right, what do these artifacts represent? Okay, so in, in the case of an atomic force microscope, we see the target only indirectly, right? We see it via seeing an artifact that represents the target. The same is not true for optical microscopes. We do not see an artifact that represents the, the, the target in the case of an optical microscope. Um, I think that there is a perfectly sensible distinction here, right? I think it's quite reasonable to say that we observe, that we see through an optical microscope in a way that we just don't see through an atomic force microscope or an electron microscope or lots of other types of microscopes. So, um, that's, so that's where I draw the line. And I think that it's act, that, that's, that seems to me to be um, a lot less arbitrary than the line that Van Frassen draws, right? I mean, it's not really clear to me why, you know, you, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why you'd be okay with like magnifying glasses, but not optical microscopes. Um, uh, whereas I think that there is a, a sensible distinction to be drawn between instruments that operate by producing artifacts and instruments that don't. But, you know, that's just, that's just my thought on this. Um, the other thing I would say about observability, uh, which distinguishes me from someone like Van Frassen, is that I don't think of observability in terms of objects at least if I'm speaking carefully. Uh, so yeah, I mean, sometimes I will talk about observable objects, but generally I think of observability, strictly speaking, in terms of properties. So properties like, you know, redness, uh, warmth, um, hardness, softness, um, pungent, you know. Um, so many observations that we make are not observations of objects in any, uh, significant sense. Um, there are lots of things that where it's it's difficult to, to sort of see them as being objects, but they still impinge on the senses. So think of um, smells, for instance, right? Uh, a smell may be produced by an object, but it may not, right? Like somebody, um, you know, I can, I can say that, like, I don't know, there's the smell of wine, let's say, and so maybe there's like an actual object in the sense that there's a glass of wine, right? And I put it up to my nose and I smell the wine. Um, maybe in that sense, you'd say I'm seeing an object, but it could just be that somebody has like synthesized the compounds. Maybe a chemist has come along and synthesized some compounds in, in the air, you know, and then it's like, are you perceiving an object there? Well, I think no, but you are perceiving a property. Um, so there are things like uh, caffeine and 
indeed uh, the alcohol of wine, right? Like we feel their effects. Um, there are sounds produced by the movement of like, I don't know, the wind. There's uh, optical phenomena like rainbows and halos and light pillars, uh, where again, it's not obvious how to understand those in terms of objects. So I tend to think these days that what we actually observe are just qualities or properties. And then objects are constructions of those qualities, but we construct the objects. What we actually observe are uh, properties. At least that's the way I tend to think of it. So I think that, that um, when, you, when you say, you know, distinction between observables and unobservables, yeah, um, for me, it's, it, it's, it's not that there are observable and unobservable objects. Um, it's that there are certain properties that we can observe and, um, and then we construct the objects from them.